Wonderful. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for our second talk in the Niagara Lake Museum's 2024 virtual lecture series. I'm Shauna Butts and I will be here to field your questions to our presenter at the end of today's talk. So if you have any, please feel free to use the chat box and the Q&A functions in Zoom. We will be recording today's presentation and uploading it to our YouTube channel. So if for any reason you can't stay for the whole talk, or if you were like people yesterday morning and your internet cut out, um, you will get a link to the recording when it is posted. And if you would like to support any of our free lecture series or other programming in our collections, I will post a link in the chat box where you can make a donation. So uh, my backdrop's a little bit different today. So I am coming to you from in front of our selfie mode on the roads photograph backdrop that is in our current exhibition, Strike a Pose, The Art of Self-Obsession. And this exhibit looks at the genre of portraiture from paintings to photographs and how it has evolved into today's selfie culture. If you joined us last week, curator uh, and director of Riverbrink Art Museum explored the history of portraiture. And this week, Sonia DeLazar will be presenting our best face forward, the selfie in visual culture. Sonia is the gallery coordinator in visual arts department at Brock University. She oversees and manages the visual arts gallery at the Maryland I. Walker School of Fine and Programming Arts at Brock U and teaches in the area of art history, visual culture, and curatorial studies. Sonia is a trained uh, historian of visual culture. Her research interests include tourist landscapes, notions of the sublime, souvenirs, collectibles, and collections. And she holds a PhD in art and visual culture from Western University. So Sonia, I hand over the world of selfies over to you right now. Thank you so much, Shauna. And it's a delight to be part of these conversations and congrats on a really fun exhibition uh, right now at the Niagara on the Lake Museum. So uh, today we're gonna look at the selfie and we're gonna think about it in the context of visual culture. And so our topic of our talk today is our best face forward, the selfie in visual culture. Ah, uh, the selfie. Uh, we may be familiar with the term. It's a term that has really become grounded in public consciousness and has assumed a, a quite dominant place in our online lives in the 21st century. And so there's likely some familiarity with its defining characteristics. So let's think about that. When we think about the selfie, what comes to mind? Maybe it's a photo, an image of a subject, uh, maybe more than one subject in the frame, often human, um, but totally and sometimes uh, non-human as well. Uh, some accidental, perhaps, selfie attempts that I have found on my cell phone over the years. Um, selfies can be multimodal. Uh, they're usually facing directly into a mirror or reflection, a front-facing view, if you will, an image um, most often captured with something like a smartphone uh, or more traditional analog or digital camera. From the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a selfie is defined as an image that includes oneself, often with another person or as part of a group, and it is taken by oneself using a digital camera, especially for posting on social networks. And while that definition feels like a pretty good summary of the term, I believe there's a whole lot more to the selfie. What about the background of the selfie? The angles, lighting, what is captured inside the frame of view? What is left out of view? Do we look directly at the lens? Well, you should be. The internet tells us that's how to take the perfect selfie. Oh wait, what if that's not your intention? Look away from the lens if you would hope to create something a little more moodier. Do I keep my eyes open? Are my lips pursed enough? Am I shooting in square mode? Should I use burst mode? What about my hands? Should I hold my phone with one hand or both? Oh wait, don't I have a selfie stick somewhere? To ensure the perfect selfie, you better take a few dozen snaps just to make sure. Ah, the selfie. Whether you've taken one or several yourself, 
there's probably a good chance that you've seen someone take a selfie in public, be included in one, uh, or maybe you've just wondered about them. The selfie is indeed truly uh, enigmatic, not unlike what notions and understandings of the self can be. Is the selfie a photograph? Is it more than a photograph? What does it intend to capture? Is it performative? The selfie is a form of visual language that has met our current time and today can often say a lot about our relationship with things like technology, uh, not to mention the fixation that humans have had on their own form, their reflection, their presence. Across history, there have been many reasons to capture the likeness of oneself in various media, such as portraiture, via painting or drawing, uh, or some early photographic processes. The invention and evolution of image making has certainly contributed to how this continues to happen and how it continues to happen and unfold today. So the selfie, while it has come a long way from um, early portraiture and varying photographic methods, is not necessarily a true and true current phenomenon. The early history of photography, like photography today, includes both very beautiful self-portraits and perhaps some more technically questionable selfies or experimental ones. But thank goodness for innovative and curious minds open to experimenting with media and representation. Here we have a self-portrait uh, by Robert Cornelius. It's a daguerreotype from around 1839. So this photograph was taken likely uh, sometime in October or November of 1839. And I wanna note here, very importantly, that this is just months after Louis Daguerre, who was a French artist and photographer, invented the first practical process of photography known as the daguerreotype in the same year. This is a very early American portrait, perhaps one of the first American selfies, according to the Library of Congress, an early iteration of the selfie nonetheless. This is Robert Cornelius, the subject of the image, who's capturing himself in this photograph. So Cornelius was an American photographer and a pioneer in the history of um, photography, operating some of the earliest photography studios in the United States between around 1840 in 1842 and would implement varying innovative techniques to sig significantly um, reduce the exposure times required for portraits. So in addition to a photographer, he was also a businessman, an inventor, and a lamp manufacturer. This particular photo was taken outdoors. It was near his family's Philadelphia home. Looking at the image, we may be able to imagine him standing in front of what would have been a makeshift camera for the required exposure time of anywhere between three and 15 minutes. In that space, in that amount of time, in that window, we might imagine that there is a bit of wondering going on how this image might actually turn out, how successful it might be in comparison to how quickly technology allows us to capture an image today, let alone how images can be captured in the time frame of one minute um, or a mere few seconds. So with such a long exposure time, these early daguerreotypes were not the best choice for portraiture, but technological developments resulted in daguerreotype portrait studios becoming a bit of a craze in the 19, in the 1840s, excuse me, and 1850s. So for context on what is required for this kind of uh, photo uh, for a daguerreotype, a daguerreotype studio looked something like this. So this is an illustration of an early daguerreotype studio uh, as depicted in a woodcut by George Cruikshank from 1842. So these studios, uh, were often situated at the tops of buildings, uh, which likely would have some kind of skylight or glass roof to let in as much light as possible. We have the subject sitting uh, on, on a posing chair 
on a raised platform. And this chair would obviously be able to be rotated to, to face uh, the light. And the sitter's head uh, would often be held still by a clamp or some kind of device that would assist with and ensure absolute stillness. So in this illustration, we have a few things happening. We've got assistants polishing silver coated copper plates, uh, making them quite highly reflective. Those plates would be taken into dark rooms. They would be sensitized with chemicals. And then an operator would place these sensitized plates into the camera. Uh, and when the sitter was ready, the operator would remove the camera cover and time the exposure. So often watching it very closely with a, a, a watch. So that plate would be returned uh, to the dark room when the photographic image on the silver plate would then be kind of brought out with fumes from heated mercury. And then the image would then be fixed uh, by bathing that plate in more chemicals. So the, the photographic plate with the daguerreotype image would then be washed in distilled water and dried. So finally, after those processes, the finished daguerreotype portrait would be covered uh, by either a sheet of protective glass, uh, either mounted in a decorative frame or presented in uh, perhaps a leather bound case and then offered to the, the sitter, the paying customer. So early daguerreotype portraits were often quite small and to appreciate a lot of the fine detail, folks would often have to use uh, things like a magnifying glass. So if one was afforded uh, the opportunity to have their portrait taken, uh, they would receive something like this. Uh, this is a portrait of a daguerreotypist displaying daguerreotypes and cases pictured in what would be an airtight frame. So its popularity, the daguerreotype's popularity, um, really declined in the 1850s once faster and less expensive photographic processes would become available. So all of that is to say that I think we can get a sense then that Robert Cornelius's daguerreotype selfie would have been quite the feat to accomplish. But there were others. And as other faster uh, or less expensive photographic methods became available, we see more individuals exploring what it means to capture one's own likeness in many ways. So here we have Hannah Maynard. Uh, this work is called Untitled or uh, Tea Time. It's from the late 1890s. So Hannah Maynard was born in Cornwall, England, but spent much of her life in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, she was a photographer best known for her self-portrait work and exper experimental photography involving things like photo montage, uh, multiple exposures. And she was very active in the late 1800s and was actually the Victoria Police Department's first official photographer. She also owned her own photography studio during the 1860s. So today Maynard is, is known best for these kind of eccentric self portraits that uh, are using photographic tricks and in this example tea time uh, show her as multiple images in the same frame so this is too something that we see a lot of today on various social media platforms with the aid of photo editing programs and apps but this work untitled tea time hilariously portrays two hannah maynards identically dressed in Victorian dresses having tea with one another. Meanwhile, what appears to be a painting of Hannah Maynard or image of Hannah Maynard on the wall is playfully uh, pouring tea on one of the seated Hannahs. So a work like this not only reveals a sense of personality, character, but also reveals a brilliant knowledge of multiple exposures. So her experimental selfies or self portraits involving photo montage and multiple exposures were quite fashionable during her time and they were often printed in poster size or featured in things like 
cabinet cards. So it's important to keep in mind that we're referencing Victorian times here when having such a profession was quite unusual for a woman. The woman in this image is using a Kodak Brownie camera to take what we can consider is a mirror selfie, more simply a photo of oneself um, while looking at one's own reflection in a mirror. So Eastman Kodak introduced the Brownie camera uh, in 1900, which was a tiny cardboard box camera with a meniscus lens whose film could be taken out of the camera after shooting and developed at home. The Brownie was a very affordable and handy camera series designed to popularize the practice of photography, uh, not to mention heavily marketed towards women, children, and the working class, which invited and afforded the opportunity to take pictures where, when, and how they wished. So they were sold, these cameras were sold for the price of around $1 when they hit the market, and the design was quite simple, point and shoot language that isn't unfamiliar to us even today. This was a huge stepping stone in the history of photography as it made photography available to the masses. But a very brief visual analysis reveals what I particularly love about this image, and that is what else we can infer from it and what this practice of taking a photo of oneself may tell us about ourselves how a photo like this might contribute to a sense or understanding of identity. And if we look closely, we may guess that this is a home-like or residential setting with some furniture flanking the borders, both inside and outside of the frame. And we also see a shelf off to the right filled with other photos. So perhaps these are loved ones, Perhaps these are special scenes of special places, but appearing here to be a photography enthusiast, it is evident that photography as a practice, whether leisurely or more seriously, is important to this individual. And selfies can indeed be much more than a photograph. What is included and what one chooses to keep within that view can certainly reveal a lot. So the self-portrait um, has been hailed by art historians as one of the defining artistic genres of modernity, witness to the emergence of things like capitalism, liberalism, the photographs of oneself and selfies contribute to this arc of this genre. And they begin borrowing from concepts of self-portraiture. So like the self-portrait, the selfie proves to be an illuminating example of what we can call the self-document. So the selfie is a culturally formative example of what is now a universal phenomenon and a reflection on how our understanding of the self may be changing in this digital age. So in the digital age, we are seeing new kinds of documents emerge and proliferate which has really provoked questions of what documents are, um, how they relate to things like communication, information, and knowledge. So such questions are increasingly urgent as new documentary forms and techniques are changing the way that we understand and act uh, in the world. So document theory is an interesting concept around cultural products like selfies. Document theory emerged in the first half of the 20th century and really has evolved greatly since the 1990s. Broadly speaking, document theorists view artifacts and objects in an open format as long as the document carries physical material traces, uh, mental information content, and socio-cultural relationships. So in this regard, Photographs of oneself, either physical or digital, can be viewed as a document. Other interesting types of documents can include things like spoken language, music, live performance. So at present, if pressed to provide 
a definition for self-portraiture or selfies to further elaborate on Merriam-Webster's definition of the selfie. The definition articulated by the Oxford English Dictionary reads, quote, a self-made portrait of oneself, end quote. This leaves three difficult questions, maybe more, to answer. What is the self? What is a portrait? And how is oneself to be understood? In art history, there have been innumerable commentaries uh, on the self-portrait, and in recent years, commentaries on the selfie. But remarkably, the self-portrait and the selfie continues to be really challenging to define. And art historians have worked with implicit assumptions and readings and understandings about what is and what is not a self-portrait or a selfie. But we'll come to see how this has been uh, problematic. So the first kind of conceptual reflection of the selfie, I believe, borrows from the world of self-portraiture and Ludwig Goldscheider's 500 self-portraits, first appearing in 1937. So this book, uh, as its title suggests, 500 self-portraits, uh, which are glossed by no more than, than 50 pages of text, Goldschneider observes here that the degree of likeness which the earliest of self-portraits achieve is not of much importance. So it's a question of the degree of realism in the representation as a whole, depending not on ability, but on things like style. Uh, that is to say, on the aims of the period and the aims of the artist. So as most of us are well aware, the widespread availability of camera and internet equipped smartphones has given much rise to the selfie, which the Oxford English Dictionary and the Merriam-Webster Dictionary define as a kind of self-portrait. So indeed today for many, the selfie might be one of the first things that comes to mind when they hear the word self-portrait. In some circles of thought, the two are even equated. Of course, and here having one of Rembrandt's uh, self-portraits, of which I won't point out uh, the pursed sort of today's lingo of the duck, <laughs> the duck face. Um, but of course, we are tying language, our language today, to something of the past. But from an art historical perspective, Rembrandt's self-portraits are an exercise in self-examination. The artist seeking to know uh, himself as he really was and to analyze his own character and emotions. And he did so by painting himself in a variety of ways, not unlike a selfie taken today with the desire to capture a part of the self. So more recently, the Philadelphia Office of Arts, Culture and Creative Economy presented the exhibit, Veterans Empowered Through Art, the six week selfie project. And it was the culmination of things like museum tours and workshops and included sketches, uh, complete self-portraits, poetry and personal photos of veterans. So visual scholar Nick Mirzoff believes that the selfie quote, expresses, develops, expands, and intensifies the long history of the self-portrait, end quote. Mirzoff sees the selfie as a digital networked outgrowth of self-portrait genre. So we may find ourselves returning to the question of what constitutes the selfie? S scholars <laughs> have not fully answered that question, and I believe we may be a ways away from fully being able to but as a result, art history alone as a discipline may not seem the best or well-equipped discipline to discuss some of the challenges that are presented by the selfie, which have become more commonplace uh, today during, during the 21st century. So the spheres of visual culture and even popular culture help us unpack things a bit. So this brings me to the work of someone like Cindy Sherman an American artist whose body of work consists of photographs of herself in these various guises. So art historians regard works as self-portraits, forms, iterations of self-portraits as demonstrated in the collections of critical and scholarly essays of her work. But still, 
um, Sherman emphatically claims that her works are not or not only self-portraits. As she explains in a New York Times interview, she said, I feel I'm anonymous in my work. When I look at the pictures, I don't quite see myself. They aren't self-portraits by definition. Sometimes I disappear. So Sherman uses this modality of the self-portrait to performatively poke at and probe the ways in which identity um, is and how it has been culturally constructed. Are Sherman's works self-portraits? Are they not? Are they selfies? These questions are growing in some urgency as the idea of the self-portrait and selfie become bent and addled or muddled. So it becomes a bit confusing when we really stop and think about it. So there is some criteria that I like to associate with the self-portrait or the selfie. Uh, it must do more than simply convey the external appearance of the subject. For example, I like to think that a selfie must kind of nod in some way um, to a subject's maybe internal landscape, be it desire, or mood, or emotion. Uh, it should show us what the subject wants us to see and how the subject wants to be seen. Many scholars link the selfie to the self-portrait. In a few cases, the link is earnest and examined. People like Nick Mirzoff, who mentioned before, and writer Jill Rettberg, for instance, do maintain that the selfie is a manifestation of the self-portrait genre. Others moderate this a little, saying that even if this is the case, the two simply cannot be equated. For example, art critic Jerry Saltz argues that selfies and self-portraits are sufficiently different because of the necessary skill and the training that's involved. So as it turns out, even what does and does not count as a selfie is unclear and is pretty subject to debate in popular forums. But given this bit of confusion and disagreement at times, it is worth spending some time conceptualizing the selfie itself. So we know that the selfie is defined as a photograph that a person takes of themselves, generally with a smartphone, a smartphone, which is then shared with others, often shared with others online. As this suggests, selfies are ways of documenting social facts, such as where one has been, who they may have been there with. And given our local landscape in Niagara, uh, not an unfamiliar scene. And often a practice that I, for one, know I, I do as well, uh, capturing memories via the selfie. So to this definition, accounts have added that Selfies capture these spontaneous and casual moments, which are shared immediately. And as such, they promote uh, a focus on the present. So the selfie has truly developed alongside the smartphone device, which integrated a camera with web sharing capabilities. Visually, selfies are distinct for some of their formal aspects. They're taken with wide angle lenses, um, sometimes we have the photographer subject's arm showing and at angles that maybe belie a bit of an amateur uh, composition. But indeed, part of the selfie's proliferation may be that it does not really require a true technical skill. They generally depict part of the photo photographer uh, subject's body um, and surroundings. So we have author Brooke Went discussing how the selfie limits itself to the photographer subject's external appearance, minimizing the non-visual aspects of the person. But moving away from the selfie's content and towards how selfies are distributed and consumed, author Paul Frosch argues that one cannot recognize a selfie just by looking at what it represents. So rather, Frosch says that recognizing an image as a selfie requires people to quote, make inferences about the non-depictive techno-cultural conditions in which the image was made, end quote. And to have been socialized into reading these images as selfies, 
So in other words, it takes a trained eye to pick a selfie out of a collection of self-portraits and photographs. In this regard, the selfie's nature as a social digital artifact must be considered. And aesthetic philosopher David Michael Levin suggests that the defining aspect of the selfie is its networked nature. So Nick Mirzoff calls the selfie a form of predominantly visual conversation, which emphasizes its communicative capacity. More precisely, Frosch describes the selfie as a form of phatic communication. So communication whose primary uh, purpose is the production, the expression, uh, main the maintenance of sociability, uh, wherein the explicit meanings of the words, or in this case, images, are not so important. Fine art researcher Daniel Rubstein develops this point a little further, arguing that we should not think of selfies as referencing their subjects, but as expressing networks within which they exist. So along this vein, we also have to think about the selfie's serial nature, the seriality of this kind of an image or photo. Producing a selfie generally involves one person uh, taking multiple photos until they're satisfied, somewhat satisfied with the final product. And this kind of capturing, this kind of um, the seriality component allows us to maybe think about the practice of selfie making as this process of authoring. And this may also kind of connect to um, or correspond with our desire, our, our, our dissatisfaction with never maybe fully being able to capture or convey uh, what we want to about ourselves. So similarly, many scholars of the selfie describe it as a site for self-authoring not only for challenging existing structures, but for realizing one's true self, if you will, in quotes, uh, through authentic expression. And author Brooke Wendt finds the selfie to be symptomatic of an endless quest for the ideal self. And she says, as if we are unable to understand our being in the world, we become then accustomed to our being in the image. So where does that leave us in our comparison to the selfie, the self-portrait, though the two may seem uh, quite similar or even coextensive, it does appear that they're really quite different. And so we know self-portraits can be in any medium, uh, but selfies are photographic. Self-portraits are generally kept to oneself, while selfies are virtually always shared. Self-portraits are often singular, uh, just one, while, while selfies have a seriality to them and they can be multiple. Self-portraits are made to last, but the selfie is for now. So in light of this, we can also appreciate that self-portraits are made over a much longer period of time uh, and skill and effort, whereas selfies are this instantaneous and unskilled uh, practice in their production alone. And on one hand, this can be perhaps interpreted as the sort of ultimate democratization of self-portraiture, whereas fine arts practice of self-portraiture is the purview of, of an elite few, requiring that technical skill uh, and aesthetic skill. So lastly, I think it's really important to consider how the self-portrait and the selfie differ in terms of the construction of the self. More accurately, both forms of self-documentation can be seen as forms of construction, not just depiction of the self. But we see the self-construction of the self-portrait is a bit deeper than the selfie. The selfie portrait, the self-portrait I should say draws in onlookers, uh, as an intentional subject, the selfie is emphasized as a node in a larger network. And if selfies really are selfies, as their name suggests, 
then they seem to propound a very particular understanding of the self as something networked and indistinct. So another aspect of the selfie that I want to touch on, and I'll bear in mind our timing here, uh, is this malleability of this form of self-representation through the use of things like filters and manipulation. So the ability to um, manipulate one's appearance with selfie filters is intuitively appealing, uh, lends itself to things like identity work, play, self-exploration. And the selfie filters that have come, come to be, uh, come to land sort of in our hands are very popular on um, social media platforms and it calls for further research within this area. Uh, I think stressing a real lack of critical insight uh, into the roles of filters in social media practices. So given that images of filtered faces uh, are some of really the most heavily engaged photos on, on social media and that they're central to digital self-presentation, the lack of research in this area at this time um, is quite surprising. So not only is filter usage ubiquitous with selfie practice, but when we look at selfies uh, of others, there's a sort of this built-in questioning um, if filtering has been applied. So that to the extent that these visual tune-ups have kind of become central to the selfie practice. And these filters allow for that production again of that the serial version of the self, the multiple versions of the self. And with the introduction of selfie filters, uh, although initially uh, producing more playful forms of editing uh, animated by the kind of novelty of phone applications, I think, We've seen them, sometimes you can slap a puppy face on you or have beer ears. There's a sense of playfulness there, um, but things have shifted significantly to a subtler, more ambient form of editing where it's not always obvious. And that has become quite normalized. So as such, looking at selfies invites us to attend to degrees and types of filtering that work in the pictures and to negotiate their implicit authenticity. So the question remains, what do you really look like? And this, of course, opens a lot of questions around production processes, um, anxieties about authenticity. And this photographic filtration is not only isolated to digital image making. Um, we've got uh, early forms of photo manipulation being traced back throughout uh, the history of photography. But in, in 1974, Bryce Baer invented the filter that allowed photographs to be colored, followed by the invention by of the um, first black and white digital camera in 1975 by Stephen Sasson, which we're seeing here. Moving ahead in, in 1987, the Knoll brothers released Photoshop. Uh, which was sold to Adobe in 1988. These features became widely available, implemented in mobile apps, uh, accessible, relatively affordable for amateur users. Later on, iPhone would release softwares uh, and development kits, which would really commercialize and popularize this notion of filtering and editing. And so many filters involve the use of facial recognition software that identifies a face in the camera and the editing apps range in their affordances from color filters, presets of photo editing programs like Adobe Lightroom, uh, Snapchat stickers and geo filters, facial recognition apps of which there are many. But these developments allow for more comprehensive uh, structural edits where the face's features and its proportions can be more fully reconfigured. So the way that we consume selfies is an interesting phenomenon as well, especially those selfies that utilize uh, filters and embellishment. And so as mentioned, they these filters really add a playful virtual dress up or tune up um, 
And they manage, they also help manage the kind of vulnerability of, of visibility. Um, so that vulnerable nature of becoming visible. Uh, and this, of course, we have to remember comes full circle to things like beauty standards and idealization of self image. And so research suggests things like photos involving faces are most likely to get your likes and your comments on social media platforms. Uh, filtered photos are more significantly uh, more likely to be commented on. And there's a lot of stats out there, but a 2015 study suggests that there is a nearly 33% increase in the viewing and commentary of selfies with filters that have been applied. While photographs with things like warm tones, high exposure, high contrast are especially effective in increasing engagement. But this, of course, you know, brings and presents quite conflicting messages about depersonalization. For example, skin smoothing apps uh, render faces slightly blurry so that the shape, the size of facial features are difficult to discern, uh, rendering faces more generic looking. And I thought it was quite interesting in reading a bit more about the selfie that some research actually suggests that selfies produce this disempowerment paradox where filters can be liberating, but simultaneously heteronormative. So many filters do things like automatically lighten skin, thin bodies, narrow noses, remove wrinkles and skin creases, and more. These actions mark filters as quite racialized, gendered, and normative. They tell us a lot about who is welcome, to participate and considered worthy of digital vis visibility. But it bears reiterating that this phenomena is raced, is gendered, is classed, is aged and abled, while filters can monitor and keep out implicit forms of things like personhood. So in this regard, filters can underscore how our posted image, our selfie is not entirely ours. And here we are at our conclusion. These discussions around the selfie really indicate a fluid and evolving techno-social network where the introduction of the selfie as a form of self-expression initially encouraged playful and various forms of representation driven by the novelty that they afforded, um, but has shifted toward these toward these more subtler, more ambient forms of editing and post-production that have become dangerously and deeply naturalized. So as photography filtering shifted from play to allowing for the curation of a natural aesthetic, a series of ambiguity, ambiguities have emerged and the distinctions between edited and non-edited, natural and natural aesthetic are blurred the nature of photography has shifted due to the dissemination of edited images, producing intense practices of looking and effective engagements born from this kind of skepticism of the eye and practice of looking. So if there is a central aim to my presentation today, it is that digital cultures and particularly the phenomenon of selfies are quite slippery subjects. In my view, the selfie is what scholar W.J.T. Mitchell termed an objectionable object, which reveals an artifact's social or cultural, cultural role. Selfies are often ridiculed and can be hard to look at at times, but they ask us to look directly into the eyes of others, to see their desires, their longings, their hangups, uh, and their complexities. Selfies are mirrors and they ask us how we should approach them. What methodology, sh methodology should be employed? These questions are not easily answered. Though I do find that visual culture studies is a very useful means to address the many and ongoing questions posed by the selfie alone. So I'm going to end here. Um, 
just for fun, landing on, on my concluding slide uh, with something out of this world. So this is astronaut Eki Hoshidi's selfie with the earth and the sun, uh, which I think is quite fun and truly a reminder that, that the selfie captures us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. I'm so busy taking selfies over here. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone at home watching is taking selfies too. I better take one too, actually. You should, absolutely. It's like the perfect time to do it. <laughs> here we are. Awesome. I was gonna say, everyone say cheese, but no one can see you. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, Sonia. There's a lot to think about like in terms of selfies that I don't think we always consider either. Um, and so I will let people filter in questions and yes, Ted Rumble says selfie was the Oxford dictionary word of the year in 2013. Yes. Yes. That's how popular it was. And I think too, that the term was coined by an, a drunk Aussie who was in the hospital, if I'm not mistaken on that one. <laughs> I think I did come across reading that at one point. Yeah. 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 I guess he had a rough night and was sending photos of himself at the hospital to his friends and said something like, sorry for the selfie. And then ever since then, there it was. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Um, Gail says Canada's history magazine recently had an article on women photographers, including Maynard and one from St. Catharines. Amazing. Yeah. So there's a lot to like even consider um, with selfies as well. And I was just thinking like, as you were going through your presentation, um, you know, the notion of filters, like those, those just exploded out of nowhere. And kind of the idea, like, is the photo authentic? Is it inauthentic? And I guess my question to you is when painters took their own self portraits, is there almost a level of inauthenticity to them because they are holding the brush. They can, you know, remove those lines, remove moles, make themselves look younger. So is there a little bit, um, I guess maybe more similarities than maybe what we're thinking of or what other um, scholars have thought about? I think that's a great question. And of course, you know, hard, hard to really answer, but I think of course, like there's going to be that artistic license. I think as humans, we're, we're, we're constantly kind of like striving to see ourselves. And I, I think there's a lot of sub subjectivity there. Like, do we really see ourselves objectively? Um, I know like in terms of psychoanalysis, sometimes, you know, early in the morning, you know, if I'm washing my face and, you know, I kind of really look at myself, really look at the real capital R, um, you know, it's like this break in reality, but we, I think we always have a filter that we kind of see ourselves through. So I, I don't imagine that, you know, when artists were creating their self portraits, they weren't seeing themselves the way they wanted to be seen. I know that of course there's, there's some portraits that include the, the very chas, the warts and all, but um, I think there's always a bit of a filter we're, we're seeing ourselves or hoping to see ourselves through. Mm -hmm. Um, Ted is asking, it seems to me that most self-portrait paintings are of men, but more digital selfies today are of women. Is that true? And what is going on here? Mm, good question. Um, you know, I think I, there's a lot of stats, uh, out there, but I think there are, there are a lot of women, um, uh, who are, Perhaps, you know, there might be this struggle with with self-image um, that I think women have, you know, beauty standards have always been something that have been a, a conversation. Um, and these sort of standards of beauty uh, can impact uh, a lot of things like mental health and how we see ourselves. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if if more digital selfies are truly of women um because maybe there is that, that connection to striving for, uh, reaching for challenge, challenged ways of how we see ourselves, how we portray ourselves, how we have been seen, um, you know, culturally throughout history. So what's going on here? I, I don't know. Um, is it maybe I, that I do... 
maybe women were more the subject rather than the takers because I see a lot of you know portraits of women out there as well yeah and of course you know from from an art historical point of view like that's that's an important acknowledgement the sort of imbalance of power the power dynamic of of who's seen how how they're portrayed how they're being seen and who's doing who's doing the seeing so the kind of conversation about the gaze be it the male gaze um yeah a lot of a lot of questions and i do also want to note it wasn't something that was talked about but you know all of all of this i think comes back to to you know thinking about how all of this impacts how we are just as people in the world how it affects us uh, and also the the real danger i think the dark side of of social media platforms and the ways we portray the ways we share parts of ourselves so i didn't touch on it but that's certainly an important thing to remember with the selfies that they're very loaded they're very loaded sort of like documents of our of our time and Frida Kahlo was also someone did a lot of self-portrait paintings of herself do you know the number off the top of your head I don't I feel like it's got to be in the 80s I think because it's she probably, was yeah. yeah she was laid up with some illness there for a while and yeah she had that mirror I think she said that was like above her bed yeah and that's how she practiced was yeah, yeah. her self-portrait Mm -hmm. um Barbara Worthy says does the future of selfies depend on the full out use of social media as opposed to art galleries or photo albums that's that's interesting um you know I I can't help but think you know when I when I think about social media how it's almost like is this the new photo album like is this where we document our lives does do our lives live in this digital sphere so much more than they had um and I, that's a great question to think about like the future of selfies depending on the full out use of social media i do think you know um our future is is digital like we're we're headed there and again i didn't talk about it but there's so much right now happening with things like um ai generated images the way to that you know selfies can identities can be kind of constructed through this conglomeration of of people and and like this like network of images of people creating creating selfies or how you, how you can be blended or apps that um I recently I saw one that imagined trying to you know pair two people and like what would you look like then um so you know I think the future is very you know like it's it's going to be technical it's going to be digital but I hope a part of me really hopes that we don't lose the kind of tangible way we can, you know, document our lives in a, a more present kind of hands on way. I, I feel, you know, in thinking about social media as these new iterations of, of galleries of uh, photo albums, uh, it feels, it, it feels distant and disconnected to me. So I, I hope we don't only head in that direction. Do you think that, um, you know, in the future, there's always that question, are selfies, are they, are they a form of art or not? And do you see, you know, 50, 75 years down the road, you know, exhibitions on selfies? I mean, what we produce is often then shared <laughs> and looked upon and investigated and analyzed. So maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, I know. <laughs> but I, you know, like, again, like, just to reiterate that, you know, the selfie is this, it's part of our visual language. So, you know, it's, it's defining our time. It's defining itself. It's ongoing as it, you know, as, as it e exists and evolves. Uh, so, you know, for something to have that much weight, like it's, it's an object, it's a document of our time. So we, I don't imagine it will go away. I don't think so either. And I think I read a fact too, and I, this probably paints millennials in a very bad light, but a millennial is believed to, or will take 25,000 selfies in their lifetime. 
So there yeah. certainly will be no um, limits on the number of selfies for a future <laughs> art exhibition. Yeah. Exactly. It'll just be, you know, the challenge may be fun picking the right one because that seems to be the, the thing it's done right there's like this this multitude the seriality of the self and then we we go and discern which which one you start with twenty five thousand and you end up with 10 that's right and then you may still delete some of those exactly. marie says frida did 55 self portraits wow yeah that's incredible it is absolutely um i don't see any other questions um so i think we will end it there thank you so much sonia for joining us today um at a look at selfies and selfie culture i think it kind of opens our eyes a little bit more on maybe a subject matter that has a bit of a dark cloud over it um but they seem to be here and not going away for the next little bit so it's great to learn a uh, different perspective on on their place in our in our history and our society absolutely so um we have a next our next virtual lecture um, with us is Wednesday, February 7th. And an award-winning journalist and author, Julian Shear, will be presenting the North Star, Canada, and the Civil War plots against Lincoln. Um, so we hope you can join us next week. It is seeming to be a very popular lecture. So if you are wanting to attend that one, get your registration in um, before that next week uh, so you can secure your spot. Um, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful day. The weather is very spring-like today, so I hope you get out and enjoy a walk and um, see some tulips kind of coming up. We have some tulips coming up in our garden, which is crazy for January 31st. Um, so please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Sonia, as well, for your time. Thank you.